I would make a list of the most frequently asked questions from passengers, the autopilot would be in the top five. What it can do and does and what it doesn't. Obviously, it's a fascinating topic and the greatest stories about it are circulating. Okay, for an off crossing, turn right. Foxtrot Delta Delta Zero, wind 270 degrees, 16 knots, runway 02, cleared for takeoff. Avenger 360 degrees at 700 degrees of right. Welcome here to Aviation Easy Explained for the Non-Aviator. What is an autopilot anyway? What is it there for? What can it do? What can it not do? Let's clarify that now. Commercial aircraft are not built for the pilot to pursue a hobby and accordingly use the aircraft controls with passionate joy to fully exploit and maneuver the aircraft in its three dimensions. That would inevitably lead to the vomit bag becoming the most important companion in a passenger aircraft and nobody wants that. Rather, the pilot's job is to operate safe, efficient and quite clearly to offer comfort as much as possible. Such a passenger aircraft is quite complex and the aim of the pilot should always be to be one step ahead of every possible problem. In order to make that happen, you need to have an overview, but that might be only achievable as long as your head offers free capacities and your attention is not strained or distracted too much by something else. If you fly an aircraft purely manually, especially in clouds or at night under instrument flight conditions, the continuous observation and interpretation of the flight instruments require a high level of concentration. Your eyes circle primarily according to a trained cross-check procedure over the gauges or displays of the aircraft attitude, the altitude, the rate of climb or descent, the speed and the heading and not forget the secondary instruments as well. Any discrepancies must be corrected as soon as possible. However, I can only initiate a necessary correction back to my trajectory after the instruments have indicated a deviation. And here we will find already the first unrest in the flight behavior. Because until I get the deviation visually displayed on the instrument, it has happened already fractions of a second ago. Depending on how precise my instruments are and how quickly I recognize the deviation, I can initiate a correction, for example, on the controls or the throttle levers. But then again, it takes fractions of a second before the aircraft has implemented my control input and I can as a result confirm the correction on the instruments. The manually flown trajectory always has slight movements. And that's exactly what the autopilot does much faster. It gets information directly from the sensors which among other things determine that the speed is just beginning to decrease even before the instrument would make it visible to the pilot. This allows the autopilot to react quicker. The necessary corrections are minor and as a positive consequence it needs smaller control surface deflections. Much more important however is the distribution of attention as to whether the aircraft moves slightly. Even an experienced pilot needs around 50% of his attention purely to manage a stable and coordinated operation when flying manually. An inexperienced pilot, 80 to 100%. That means there is hardly any or no more capacity left. And the chances are high that he may miss important information from other systems, for example, the oil pressure or the fuel gauge. Here, the autopilot takes the strain off and the pilots have considerably more capacity available to manage the flight sequence. So let's take a look at what an autopilot actually looks like and is structured. Like so much in modern aircraft, it always starts with a computer. But that alone would probably not be enough because the autopilot system we are looking for is supposed to fly the aircraft. In order to be able to do that, it first has to know where in space it is and for what that it needs information. For example, there would be data on temperature and air pressure 
as these two values have a direct influence on the flight altitude and aerodynamic behavior. The measured barometric flight altitude is the basis of an altitude display. There are static ports on the front outside of the aircraft to measure and calculate it. The speed is measured by the pitted tubes. They can also be found on the front outside of the fuselage. Not necessary for an autopilot, but nowadays common equipment are data from a GPS, Global Positioning System. This satellite system allows a precise calculation of position, altitude, speed, track, and also wind calculations. Should the aircraft be equipped to carry out instrument approaches based on a so-called ILS, instrument landing system, antennas for reception are built onto the aircraft and this data also made available so that the autopilot will be able to fly on the correct approach path too. Well, and last but not least, information for one or more inertial reference systems. These gyro platforms are completely independent and therefore do not have to receive any transmitted signals in order to be able to determine their spatial position, as GPSs or radio navigation devices do. They are mandatory and available in commercial aircraft, probably not in non-commercial single engine aircraft because they're quite expensive. Now the autopilot computer is adequately supplied with data to determine its position. But we still need a little more because we won't be able to operate it too. An input console is required for this. In commercial aircraft, the operator's input takes place via the flight management system. Including the route planning, that could then be flown by the autopilot. The second input device, the so-called flight control unit, FCU, is used to make spontaneous changes regardless of a planned route. For example, let's assume that the navigation computer is operating the autopilot and we fly with uh, flight management navigation on our route in 39,000 feet. Now a radio message comes in and the pilots are instructed to turn to a heading of 300 degrees. In this case, the pilot selects the 300 degrees up here on the flight control unit and activates the heading mode by pulling the knob. Now, the autopilot steers to 300 degrees and navigation mode is no longer active. That means the autopilot no longer follows the route in the flight management system. The same goes for the window left to it. Here, I can enter and activate a different speed. However, so that the aircraft can also fly speeds automatically, an automatic thrust, thrust control system, similar to the autopilot is required, which regulates the thrust demand to reach and maintain a pre-selected speed. The automatic thrust control system is not integrated in the autopilot, but these systems are also standard in modern commercial aircraft. So back to our autopilot system. We are not quite finished yet. The question is, how do we put our calculations into practice? So far, we only have mathematical calculations in the autopilot computer. Well, that's what the flight control computer is for. It now converts the digital calculations of the autopilot computer into analog control signals, which then operate the control services either via electrical motors or hydraulic actuators. Finally, we have all the necessary components available. Now we can turn on the autopilot. On this Airbus flight control unit, it will be activated here. As soon as the autopilot is switched on, manual flight controls are deactivated in modern aircraft. If you would move them anyway, or if you press this red button on the side stick, the autopilot will be disconnected immediately. All commercial aircraft have at least two such autopilot systems and they are completely independent of each other. In other words, all sensors are available twice and the power supply for the various computers comes from different sources. How does it work in practice? 
Autopilot 1 is on and we are heading 250 at 2000 feet. Now comes instruction, turn to heading 200, climb and maintain 5000 feet. In phase 1, the autopilot should now be programmed with the given heading and altitude. I'm turning the value 200 and 5000 up here now. In phase 2, the autopilot checks where it is at all by asking its sources about this. The reply will be 2000 feet and heading 250. Now it knows it has to climb 3000 feet and to turn 50 degrees to the left. Next comes phase 3 and it initiates this by sending the corresponding signal to the flight control computer. From now on, the autopilot compares the phases in a loop again and again in case some value could change. As an example, I might be advised to continue climbing to 10,000 feet a short time later instead of the 5,000 feet as advised before. Then it checks phase 2 again, then phase 3 again. A constant comparison of target value and actual value. As we approach the chosen altitude and heading, the system changes to phase 4, so to slowly modify the control signals so that the aircraft does not overshoot the altitude or the heading. This means that the rate of climb is slowly reduced and the autopilot initiates capturing heading and altitude. As soon as the altitude and heading are stable, the autopilot switches to phase 5. From now on, it holds the values. In summary, flying with the autopilot means instead of manually steering the control surface as before, the desired flight parameters are now either made available by the navigation computer or set on the flight control unit using selector knobs. The autopilot then flies it off. What is the autopilot not capable to do? It cannot taxi and take off the aeroplane. It cannot change the configuration, for example, moving the flaps or operating the landing gear. It cannot detect any ground obstacles, other aircraft or thunderstorms and then automatically initiate necessary evasive maneuvers. And finally, it cannot follow instructions from an air traffic controller. Can it land? Yes, it can. Not every autopilot, but those in today's commercial aircraft are able to do it. But that sounds easier as it actually is. In order to be permitted to land automatically, some requirements must be met. A. The aircraft must be certified for automatic approaches and landing. Part of this certification are at least two independent autopilot systems that monitor each other during such an approach. B. The crew must be qualified for this type of approaches. C. The captain must be the pilot flying. D. The airport must be equipped and approved for automatic landings. And E, the airport must have the necessary system switched on and low visibility procedures must be in progress before an automatic landing can be carried out. There are some exceptions in terms of training, but that goes too far today. I will explain this again in a more detailed separate video. We have reached the end. My explanations have been a simplified way how such autopilot systems work. In commercial aircraft, these systems are much more complex, but the philosophy and structure is comparable. I hope I was able to generate a little understanding and clear ambiguities. Thank you very much for your time. See you next time.